Okay, so, so we've addressed the clinical factors, but one of the issues is mm -hmm. we hear, you know, in many of the trials that we're participating, you have to be PDL1 positive. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It's a great question, and we get asked that by patients all the time. As I'm starting to discuss these studies, frequently I get asked, well, why can't you just test me before, before I have to go through all this additional studies um, for the trial? And I have to explain to them, we don't know what it means to be PDL1 positive. Or negative. Or negative. Um, each company that's developing a PD-1 or PDL1 drug has also developed their own test for how do we select these patients. They're based on PDL1 expression, um, but just as each of the therapeutic drugs is a different antibody, the antibodies to look for PDL1 are different as well, um, as well as the threshold and which cells are we looking at. Um, so uh, Roy had described that it's the PDL1 on the tumor and the PD-1 on the T cell interaction, but he was simplifying it um, as needed for this um, kind of a discussion. However, it's much more complex than that, as Roy well knows. Um, and, and so is it the PDL expression, PDL1 expression on the tumor, or is it really on the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes? And what part of tumor versus environment is really critical? And that's actually, there are different opinions about that if you talk to the, the scientists, the different companies developing these different assays. And then there's also different thresholds of what does it mean to be positive? So if you're doing a pembrolizumab study, the likelihood of a patient being PDL1 positive is going to be well over 50%, 60, 70, 80%. Uh, but if you're looking at some of the other companies and their assays, it's more like 30%. Um, and Roy had alluded to that already. Um, the patient populations going on these trials are different. And if you want to get a higher response, then you're looking at a much narrower group of patients. But in the group of patients excluded, you're probably missing some patients who would benefit from the drug. And so it's that how do we find the balance between giving it to everybody, knowing that then we're only helping a few, versus excluding some who would benefit so that we can make a much higher response? And we don't have answers to all of those questions. Yeah, yeah. and I, I would also add to Dr. Wakeley, you know, it's also a very dynamic marker. Well, that's and it, it fluctuates yeah. right. during the course. Absolutely. Yeah. And so there's a wealth of data coming out now that we may be able to induce PDL1 mm -hmm. expression, for instance, if we target with an EGFR TKI in a mutant. Mm -hmm. And so we don't know any of this yet, and that's why it's so problematic to use this as a biomarker. Mm -hmm. It's adaptive. You know, it's mm -hmm. Gamma interferon is the single best inducer of PDL1. Mm -hmm. You know that if you treat a patient, and we did pre and post biopsies, in the post biopsy, you're going to see upregulation of PDL1 in a patient who's responding with more T cells. So when you measure, it's going to make a big difference. Absolutely. And so, so now we're using old biopsies, biopsies before we've given radiation. I couldn't agree with you more. It's really uh, very messy. There's also a lot of heterogeneity involved in this whole process. And then, of course, the whole issue of a continuous variable versus yes, no. So, right. you know, it's, it's more complicated. Again, we're simplifying a bit, but EGFR mutations, there are a lot of them, but you have one or you don't. Right. Mm -hmm. Now you're at 10%, 20%, 30%. Where do you draw that line? Mm -hmm. So it, it does add a whole bunch of complexities. And then the thing that really makes me, it fascinates me, is every single company we've talked about that's developing a drug has its own marker. Right. So is my pathology lab going to need to get five machines <laughs> and run every different marker? And, and how are we going to decide what we're going to do? We need some sort of standardization. Right. How are we going to resolve that issue? Well, you know, the first step is we need to get these approved, and, and that the good news is, you know, for patients, is that there are multiple avenues moving forward, and I think we probably will have some of these agents in lung cancer, you know, in the not-too-distant future. So then I think we're going to have to have some, you know, maybe the ISLAC, you know, I know Fred Hirsch and the ISLAC are working on a, a committee to do this. Maybe groups are going to need to come together through uh, grants, you know, and, and other processes, and we're going to have to figure this out. I can't imagine we'll run more than one or two platforms. And um, it also depends, will, they, will these agents be approved with a biomarker or not? Right. Well, that's, that's melanoma, a question. it's not. Well, that's, that's where mm -hmm. I was going because my understanding of the, you know, the press release trial, as we call it, the nivolumab second line versus docetaxel, that was an unselected patient. Right. Mm -hmm. So the question is, would you rather have an antibody attached to a biomarker or, or not? Would you would take all comers? Well, I, I would, you know, first of all, I, let's just get it out there and then we can figure out how to use it. That said, we have to be realistic. You know, I, people come to all of our sites because we have immunotherapy trials. And uh, I would do the same thing if I were a patient. You know, if I was a squamous patient or a refractory adenocarcinoma patient and there were no driver mutations. 
But still, remember, one out of five is benefiting, the other four to five are not. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of work to do, so, so we are going to have to figure it out. And if it's not this marker, perhaps it's another T regulatory cell that we measure. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need more functional markers. Maybe we need to get a biopsy of fresh T cells and, and do something with it. So I'd say that if, however they get approved, Mark, we are going to have to continue to do better because given the toxicities we talked about, mm -hmm. if you're going to give these drugs to someone who has no chance of benefiting, and if we're going to start using them in maintenance therapy, uh, neoadjuvant therapy, you know, chemo radiation, we've got to figure this out. Right. And I think um, the combinations are going to be really important. Uh, Roy's already mentioned some of them, as has Anne. Um, but there's also some very exciting data looking at these agents with radiation, uh -huh. or um, Anne mentioned with the EGFR TKIs. Um, it's, you know, there's the checkpoint inhibitor, but you also have to be dealing with getting antigen presentation. And so if we can figure out ways of, of doing that better, um, and that's where there's a wealth of trials. I don't think we could even list them if we all just went around and around and around, because there's so many ongoing trials with each of these drugs in different combinations, in different subsets of patients. So just so much that we don't quite understand. Yeah, and, and I think uh, I think we've said this, but I think it's important to understand that uh, these are in first line, uh, first line trial against standard platinum-based doublets, and uh, typically in a molecularly enriched population, PDL1 pop mm -hmm. population. But those studies are very interesting. We're, we're involved in the nivolumab first line trial, and um, uh, it's a little too early to tell. Uh, my, my gut sense is not quite uh, ripe enough to figure out uh, whether this is a good strategy mm -hmm. or not. But certainly, we had a limited amount of data looking at previously untreated patients, both with nivolumab and pembrolizumab, mm -hmm. that looked similar to platinum based doublets, mm -hmm. small numbers of patients. So, whether or not enriching with PDL1 status is the right thing to do is, is not entirely clear. Um, but those trials are ongoing and important. Right. I think one other thing we should point out, too, is that these are all trials because they require biomarkers, because they require most of them fresh tissue, waiting for results. These are not all patients. Patients with rapidly progressive disease are not really getting these drugs yet, and that's something that's going to be important to keep in mind and continue to address as we expand the patients who are being exposed to these drugs and treated. That's a really well, good one point. Of, well, one other thing I would add is I've had tremendous patient support for this, alluding to what you said. You know, patients come from far away, and they're very enthusiastic. Right. They're willing to undergo additional biopsies, and I think it's been really rewarding to see the patient enthusiasm for trial participation right. with this class of drugs. Oh, yeah, it, it is amazing the patients uh, on the nivolumab versus the standard of care trial literally jump out of their chair when you tell them they've been randomized to the immunotherapy arm. Um, you know, the line to get ke chemotherapy typically isn't very long. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't need it. Uh, but, but I think, I th Roy, did you have? No, and, and you, know, you know, one of the things we're doing now is our lung cancer master protocol. Well, that's where I was going. And, yeah. you know, our, our master protocol uh, has as the arm for the 50% of the patients who don't have a mutation uh, immunotherapy. So this is basically trying to match a patient with their mutation NCI uh, public-private partnership trial uh, with multiple companies. Uh, patients get, get sequenced, and then half the patients are going to immunotherapy, randomized against control. And you know, we have to think now about this protocol. How is this protocol going to move forward in the, in the, in the future? Um, and I sense within the next six months to a year, we're probably going to have to change that arm in some way um, because many patients will be getting immunotherapy first. So, um, you know, I think that it is something that uh, is coming to, to standard of care.